us to join together in wishing Reverend Michelle a speedy recovery and extending our gratitude to Reverend Gloria for always being ready to step forward when we need her. I am Delinda Wilkerson and this is my wife, Sarah Olson. Some of you know Chris Sally. Uh, I'm really glad to be part of a congregation where everyone is welcome. We are Pilgrim Congregational Church, United Church of Christ. We're with barriers of ethnicity, class, and sexual orientation are torn down. So whether you are old or young, rich or poor, Republican or Democrat, gay, transgender, or straight, sun kissed, sun challenged, <laughs> you are welcome here. We affirm that we are all created in the image and likeness of the Holy One and are therefore called to reject racism, fight injustice, and share our earthly and spiritual resources. We believe that faith still matters and that God is still speaking. Today is a special Sunday because we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of Pilgrim Church's adoption of the following statement. We are an open, affirming, and actively inclusive community of faith welcoming all men, women, and children, and grateful for the wholeness of the human community that we experience in diversity of race, marital status, family composition, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, age, physical, and mental challenge. We invite all who hear the call into this faith community to participate fully in the life and ministry of the church. We promise to do our best to encounter each person with love, care, and respect. Welcome to Pilgrim on this special day. Let us join together in prayer. God, we are part of the Church Universal, faithful people of every color, gender, class, sexual orientation, gender expression, age, and ability, gathered to love and serve God. We are an open and affirming church, and we rejoice in the good news which we celebrate this day. There is a place in God's heart. There is a place at Christ's table. There is a place here and in every welcoming church for all people, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and straight. God, who gathers us in this place, bids us follow in the ways of love and justice. May our hearts be open to God's still speaking, welcoming voice in our worship and our living this day and always. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Please join, uh, rise and join me and Jeff in our responsive call to worship. Even in the midst of our questions, we will pray. Even with fears of what might be, we will praise the Lord. We affirm and have been called to be witnesses to our faith. It is always frightening to step into a place we have not gone. It is important to make changes when things are not right and have conviction in times of doubt. Thank you, God. There are still so many that do not feel your love. We affirm and gather this gathering place to be a home for all people. We celebrate each accomplishment and every person who has been part of our journey. Thank you, God, for love and acceptance. We will always be challenged. We will always move forward. We are always God's
Easter have faded, and our doubts and fears are creeping in again. We somehow need to see to believe. We feel vulnerable, but are afraid to ask for certainty. We long to affirm with Thomas, my Lord and my God, but sometimes we lack conviction. Scripture printed in the bulletin, I will actually be reading two this morning. Um, the first is from John chapter 20, not 21, uh, verses 19 through 31, if you're following along. Jesus appears to his disciples. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As God has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. 
If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Jesus also appeared to Thomas. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands on his side, I will not believe you. A week later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hands, and touch my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus said, Because you have seen, you have believed. Blessed are, those, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that we may believe Jesus is the Messiah, and that by believing we may have life in his name. The second passage of scripture I'll read this morning is from Acts chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. When they had brought them, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this Jesus' name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this one's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles said, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, who you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at God's right hand as leader and savior to give repentance and forgiveness of sins. And we are witness to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit who God has given to those who obey. The word of God for the people of God.
So just last week, seven short days ago, we celebrated Easter and spring. <laughs> it was a beautiful, warm day when many of us took the opportunity to break out our spring dresses and pastel colors, even our Easter bonnets. It was a great day of family, fellowship, delicious food, and awesome spring weather. It was easy for us to celebrate Resurrection Sunday without much hesitation, because even though we had just finished our spiritual journey through Lent with Jesus, we didn't have to physically confront the mystery of an empty tomb. We didn't actually go looking for Jesus' body that morning, nor had we visually witnessed the beating and execution of our leader, the one we were hoping would change our community, our government, our reality for the better. In fact, even as we observe the solemn remembrances during Holy Week, we had the benefit of knowing that Easter morning was coming. We were able to look forward with hope to Easter and to all the signs of spring that we associate with new life. Trees budding, flowers blooming, baby bunnies. Now, I'm not going to suggest that the emotions that I felt yesterday as I was pelted with the <laughs> spring snowstorm was anything close to what the disciples felt when they were gathered in that locked room, but it did give me a fresh perspective on this well-known story. Because usually, when I reflect on this passage from the Gospel of John, I focus on the exchange between the disciples who had the opportunity to see the risen Christ and Thomas, who initially missed out. How Thomas needed to see for himself in order to believe, and how grateful I am that Jesus wasn't offended by that. He was patient and gave Thomas what he needed in order to believe. And I'd like to think that God extends that same loving grace to all of us. This time, though, I was struck with the thought that even for the disciples who had seen Jesus on his first visit, believing that he actually was standing there in the flesh, alive and breathing, could not have been easy. They had seen him die on the cross, and with his death, their hope had died. Yet now, they all saw him, wounded, but standing right in front of them. The scripture makes it sound so simple. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. As if they never had another doubt. As if they never struggled to understand how what they had experienced only a few days earlier and what they were experiencing now could both be true. They had seen both of these things, but what should they believe? These are the same disciples who often seem to struggle to understand the lessons that Jesus was trying to teach him before he was executed as a criminal of the state. So I imagine that at that moment, when he appeared to them in the upper room, they were experiencing the full range of emotions, confusion and certainty, hope and fear, faith and doubt. Reeling from all that had occurred and to struggling to discern what comes next. And rather than address their questions or try to rationalize the unimaginable or even offer a parable, Jesus gives them a gift. Well, actually two. First, he offers them God's peace, the peace that has calmed and comforted God's beloved for thousands of years, the peace that passes all understanding. But then he breathes the gift of the Holy Spirit into the disciples commissioning them to continue to carry on his work, to be peace and forgiveness and love for the world, to do justice, love kindness, 
and walk humbly with God, to witness to the power of God and the resurrection. He breathed on them, John tells us in his gospel. More than any words could have done, this breath comes as a gift, as grace. Christ's own breath that breathes to them the spirit that will enable them to keep living, to keep breathing, to proclaim the astonishing news of the risen Christ and to be his body in this world. And so that's what they do. Despite any lingering doubts and the logical impossibility of what they have experienced, the disciples become countercultural living witnesses to the teachings of Christ. Now, of course, there are risks to being countercultural, risks to loving your neighbor regardless of who they are, where they come from, what they look like, or who they love. Risks to seeking justice and demanding equity for not only ourselves, but also for those who cannot or are systematically marginalized, oppressed, and ignored. To speaking truth to power, to not being politically correct, to making people feel uncomfortable with the way things have always been. This is true today, and as we read in the book of Acts, it was true during the time of the early church. The apostles of Jesus were preaching and living according to what they had been taught, and many people were attracted to the fledgling movement. Their enthusiasm, witness, and everyday life of the apostles and their followers, though, was an affront to the authorities, to their way of life, to business as usual. So the authorities ordered them to stop. And when that didn't work, they threw them in jail. And when that didn't work either, the apostles' response to the power structures that were displeased and disrupted by their witness was simply to declare, we must obey God rather than any human authority. So they persisted at the risk of great personal peril, empowered and compelled by the Holy Spirit. This is the same Holy Spirit that continues to empower and compel us today to fight for justice and advocate for the least of these. For when it is not easy or popular or even the, soft, the safest choice to make, we do it because it is the right thing to do. This year, and in particular this day, we are celebrating the official decision that Pilgrim made in 1998 to become an open and affirming congregation within the United Church of Christ. Now, from where I stand today, you might think that was an easy decision for us, but I can assure you, as many of you can attest to, it was not. I like to think that we did it because after much logical discussion, fact-finding, studying, arguing, discerning, and more discussing, we finally stopped trying to reason our way into the making of a decision and created room for the Holy Spirit to speak to us and guide us in the right direction. Amen. Now, some of you may be surprised to know that despite the liberal and progressive nature of our congregation and local community, we were not actually trendsetters in this movement in the United Church of Christ. In 1985, our General Synod adopted the resolution, it was called Calling on the United Church of Christ Congregations to Declare Themselves Open and Affirming. And the central affirmation of an ONA congregation is that people of all sexual orientations, gender identities, and gender expressions are welcome in the full life and ministry of the church. Now, although this resolution was adopted by the national setting of the UCC in 1985, because of our denominational polity, that is the way we govern ourselves, each local church has the freedom to choose whether or not to adopt a one Last New Year's Eve, Lancaster Congregational United Church of Christ in New Hampshire became the 1,500th ONA church in our denomination. Amen. Amen indeed. 
However, there are 5,000 churches in our denomination. And the 1,500 represents just 30% of the total. Now the good news is that progress continues and is accelerating, but the journey is long, filled with both joy and conflict, inclusion and loss. There are churches that have left the United Church of Christ because of the movement, and people who have switched local churches over this specific issue, even here within Pilgrim. Because similarly, our journey at Pilgrim has not been fast or conflict-free. We are a pilgrim, after all. <laughs> the congregation began wrestling with the decision in 1993-94, and while this was before my time, as I understand it, there was a lot of discussion, because we are a pilgrim, but the pause button was pushed before making a decision. In September 1996, Reverend Carla Grosch was installed as our senior pastor, and she committed to restart the process after she had a chance to settle in. So about a year later, Pilgrim began a thoughtful nine-month journey of discerning God's will for our congregation relative to publicly declaring ourselves as an ONA congregation. The journey included small group discussion, speakers, Bible study, and a lot of discerning. Examining our own thoughts, biases, fears, and concerns, listening to each other in love, and on our best days without judgment. Prayer and silence, straining to hear God's call. Now you might be wondering, what took us so long? Why did this require so much conversation and study? Pilgrim was such a welcoming place. I can't imagine these people wanting to exclude anyone. And as I recall, that sentiment was a key reason why there was so much debate. At Pilgrim and many UCC churches, there was a question as to why is it necessary to make an official statement, a public witness. We have been and will continue to be welcoming to everyone and fully inclusive in the life of the church, so why do we need to call that out? And particularly, why single out only our LGBTQ brothers and sisters? The process culminated in the day of discernment that some of you may remember. We uh, were joined by a Quaker discernimentarian, Joan Crawford, who was recruited to help us through the process. And in preparation for today's celebration, Reverend Carla has shared reflections of this day and described it as one of the highlights of her life. You can hear her speak about it on the Pilgrim YouTube channel. I was there, and I also remember it well, and it was indeed an amazing experience. It was a very long day, the way I recall it, with more small group discussion, reflection, and an open mic session right here in this very sanctuary. I recall, I recall personally getting frustrated and very impatient at several points, because discernment can be a challenging process for some of us. Finally, at some point, the discernmentarian noted that we didn't seem to be making progress toward a decision, and I could feel my anxiety start to rise. But then suddenly, as Reverend Carla described, there was a pilgrim Pentecost. She says it was, though, it was as though a sound came like a railroad train from the top of the sanctuary. People rushed up to the microphone and they said, no, no, we want to be open and affirming. An ONA statement was quickly crafted and adopted by consensus. Just like that. What had been so complex, confusing, and challenging was suddenly made clear and simple. We were ready to accept our call to be witnesses to God's disruptive love in our hurting world. That statement is printed on page six of your bulletin and was read as part of our opening prayer, but I'm going to read it again, because I think you can do that like a couple times in 20 years. <laughs> Pilgrim 
Congregational Church is an open, affirming, and actively inclusive community of faith, welcoming all men, women, and children, and grateful for the wholeness of the human community that we experience in diversity of race, marital status, family composition, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, age, and physical or mental challenge. We invite all who hear the call into this faith community to participate fully in the life and ministry of the church. We promise to do our best to encounter each person with love, care, and respect. To me, this doesn't seem like a radical countercultural statement, and yet sadly, I know that it is especially for the church. Some days it feels like it's becoming even more countercultural, given the divisiveness, self-centeredness, greed, and even hate that seems to be tightening its grip on our country. Messages of love, justice, peace, and forgiveness are perceived as naive, foolishly optimistic, impractical, unrealistic. And yet, that is what Easter calls us to bear witness to. Jesus lives, not because he can walk through locked doors and show his wounds to frightened disciples, but because he breathes new life into those disciples through the gift of the Spirit and commissioned them to continue his work. As followers of Christ, we too are challenged and enabled by that same Holy Spirit to witness to God at work in our lives and in the world by the way we live, speak, and speak up. Today, we celebrate 20 years of public witness as an open and affirming congregation. Certainly not the end of our journey, but an important milestone and so we give thanks for this community that has sustained us, for the Holy Spirit that has guided us, and for God's love that compels us to keep moving forward. Amen. Amen.
We will continue to work for justice and extend gentleness to one another. Twenty years is both a lifetime and a blink of an eye. We are ready for the next twenty years. We will start today as we go from this place to open the doors, repair the tears, and be the church. Amen. I'm just going to sing a short introduction and then we'll welcome all of you joining, please.